Welcome back to Policy Talks. We are continuing our conversation with Manjari Jaruhar. I'm going slowly now uh, from uh, you know the time that you've come to Hyderabad uh, and the uh, NPA, the National Police Academy, and your training years. Uh, and you've given a very detailed account of your training years. But I just want you to reflect on a similar situation for other women and women professionals who started uh, thinking of starting a career of her own and face hurdle both at the community level in you know and the family um, you know the his whole issues of gender equality and access for women uh, in accessing certain public resources be it you know career women or even you choose to be a homemaker um, how do you keep the digni dignity intact at the same time negotiate with the outside world uh, how do we look at that uh, from the context that you have been into more and more uh, women uh, are coming uh, with and coming out with their own aspirations of doing what they want to do. In uh, many cases, I find that the parents are also very supportive and they help them. And they are ready that uh, uh, um, uh, whether in terms of higher education or sending them outside the home to study in another state or in another um, or work in another state, uh, that is changing. But there are still a lot of people who uh, suffer this pushback because the biggest thing uh, in India for uh, parents is for the uh, when they have a girl child is to settle her. The major concern is that she should get settled and settlement only means marriage. That I think is a wrong attitude. There are settlement by working and marriage will happen. It is not the end and, and be all of her, the girl's existence. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, girls are still finding it uh, uh, difficult to um, uh, get out. I am mentoring a, a girl who has uh, been, uh, whose father died and she has a, a brother with special needs and uh, she lives in the village and then she decided to uh, somehow get out of the village and come to study in a, in a city. And uh, I asked her one day that, why is it that you don't go and visit your mother? She's all alone. I think she should. you should go and help her just out of curiosity. She says, no, no, ma'am, I will not go. I will. Why? I said, why will you not go? She says, the minute I enter my village, in that street only when I'm going to my home, There'll be so many people telling my mother and calling out and saying, why are you wasting money on her education? Mm -hmm. She should not be educated. You should keep the money for her marriage. Get her married and then you look after your son who has uh, special needs and uh, manage your family rather than wasting money on her. Mm -hmm. Whereas she feels that if she works hard and uh, gets a good job, she will have a dignity and she will give dignity to her mother. Mm -hmm. And once the mother... Uh, is in a condition to uh, sort of uh, leave the village. Maybe she can look after them better in a city. So this, these are these hurdles, you know, even uh, where the parents want to do something, the society also tries to impose uh, some uh, limitations uh, on the girl. So a woman has to really fight her way through. But uh, I see trends changing when I see uh, how many women constables, sub-inspectors are now coming into the police and now parents feel happy that a woman is also now in uniform and that gives them a status in the village or the in-laws also now have changed their attitude and they feel that uh, a woman in the police uh, enhances the image of the family. So now they are very accepting of a woman joining the police force or joining any job where she can bring some income to, to the house. So that trend is changing and I hope it's for the good and it will continue like this. So there's a very, very famous uh, you know, statement by Indra Nuri, the head of PepsiCo at that time, that women can't have it all. Uh, because the biological clock and the career clocks are always in, in contrast. And, you know, when you're growing up, uh, you want to have children, but at the same time, you have to look after children because the ecosystem is not there. So can women have it all? I think women can have it all. I've had it in my own career, doing a police job and with a police, uh, as a policeman, as a husband also. And I've got two children and I have managed and I think uh, women have to learn to manage things also. And uh, always uh, not be like a defensive that how can I do this? How can I not do this? 
it is a tough job for a woman it is tougher than uh, what a man has to face but uh, it is not an impossible job and if a woman wants to make then she, uh, work then she needs to also build an ecosystem around her where she moves out and also takes help from people help from her family help from her neighbors help from the society around her whoever can help her in upbringing she like in the police job you are out sometimes in the night sometimes you may have to leave early in the morning then what is the option sometimes my husband was also not posted with me but i would be having good relations with my neighbors and i would ring them up and tell them that can you come over and take charge of the children sometimes my son was sick and i had to leave for an inspection and one day when he was really very ill uh, and i had to go to for inspection to a place which was far away i now think that i took such a bold decision but uh, i told my neighbors to make sure that the maid gives him medicines and put all the medicines everything the thermometer on his bedside and then i left for that inspection now i could have postponed that inspection but i know that for an inspection by a senior officer the men work for days to update their records to update their uniform to get the barracks and everything ready for inspection it's a major annual activity of a uh, of a unit in the police and i felt that they will be all waiting for me and how can i now at the last minute say that my son has got fever and i'm not coming so even now i think whether i did the right thing or not but i did make a um, uh, change and i did not uh, say i will not come i went i was away for two days every few minutes i was checking because my husband was also not posted with me and my neighbors handled that uh, matter so the women who aspire to do their jobs have to also build that ecosystem i think that is the only way we can uh, hold and i never will advocate that women should leave their job. whatever the reason may be they should learn to manage and uh, not lose their self respect by leaving their job so this is interesting account that uh, you know uh, uh, when women i mean we want more and more women workforce not only in police service but all over but we also see that the institutions are not there to support i mean earlier used to have i know my mother has been working and my grandmother has also been working so wow. it is the third generation working women house that i have been brought up in but they all had it their own difficulties uh, in managing the household and uh, sometime at the cost of uh, many many things that you have also very clearly mentioned and um, sometimes children also take uh, they don't understand when they are growing up so they demand a lot on the parents for example if you have a you know uh, there's a parent teacher meeting and most of the time my parent teacher meeting my mother has never been there because she herself has been working and we have never seen most of the time right so we grew up with the whole sense that uh, maybe we are not taken care as much as the other uh, children but today when i look at it from the hind side i see that that's been a wonderful that my mother has also been working similarly i just want to ask you this question you talked about ecosystem but i just want to go slightly more granular to understand how does it play out uh, uh, in a sense that a society that we all not only have it in india but also south asia a similar kind of a family system work how do you look at it from that perspective in terms of the larger ecosystem that is required second is also about um, what is Uh, what do we expect also from the government because at the same time we see that the family systems are there to support but there are not many institutions where you can actually approach and uh, you know keep working uh, if you wish to how do you yes know? it's a fact that uh, i had a good uh, family support when i was working because uh, uh, there were times when um, the family support was not available but then i was dependent on my neighbors and friends to help out and uh, i had a good uh, system of help at home i made sure that i had 24 hour help and uh, uh, women if possible it's a question of affordability that i would encourage them to have a, a help a 24 hour help at home because that takes away a lot of stress but there are women uh, at the lower levels who cannot uh, afford a 24 hour help and all so for them uh, we have been saying in the government and government has now been thinking of uh, having a crash everywhere mm -hmm. and uh, for the subordinate ranks it's very important whether they are in working in the police station 
or they are working in the police lines, etc., that there is a crash available or there is a place where the woman can keep the child because it is not possible for her to uh, leave the child at home because she cannot afford to have a full-time help. In fact, uh, yesterday I met a group of lady IPS officers and we were discussing that a time has come that even when women have to be sent for training, in our training uh, academies at the level of the constable, DYSPs or even uh, IPS officers, many women are ma already married and they may have children. So I now we were now discussing that a time has come that uh, all training institutions should have accommodation for married women with children mm -hmm. and make available to them at a price which maybe the institution can pay or at a price where the woman herself can be encouraged to pay at a subsidized okay. rate uh, the help that while she's under training, the help looks after the children. Mm -hmm. So now our focus should be to build these things in our institutions that the woman can be trained and she's allowed to keep her children. And uh, uh, along with the children, she has the wherewithal to handle this uh, uh, um, uh, children and other dependents on her. So that is now if we want to encourage more women, we'll have to look at it. And now the age of marriage, etc. is also going up. So by the time the woman gets into a job, she may be already married and having children. So this is the need of the hour. So the <coughs> I feel that every effort should be made now, uh, institutionalized, that uh, when women come into the workforce, other things and their other needs are taken care of. That's interesting. But in terms of, uh, you know, uh, flexible working hours, how does it pan out for policing? Because there you need to be there in person, physically present. But there are a lot of places now that, you know, we see that we have this flexi hours working for women or you can work from home for at least once or twice in a week. Uh, so at least it gives you some flexibility uh, if you have the child has not been well you and there's a gendered responsibility for you to look after uh, the child then probably you can work from home. So something like this, uh, how do we see this from the government services, especially in the police and other related services? In the government service, uh, especially in the police, I don't think we can have uh, this system work. But uh, we can have a shift system. In fact, uh, there is a lot of uh, requests coming from the states and all that if we want to curtail police brutality and if we want to make the police more human, we should give them fixed hours of duty so that they have time to relax. Just now a constable or a sub-inspector or even police officers at senior levels, we are working 24 by 7. There is no rest. The same thing, we cannot expect that the woman also will be there. She has to look after her family. So one way of handling this in the police force is to have fixed hours. A lot of uh, um, states have made a beginning and they are giving eight hours and they are giving them off once a week or weekly off so that at least they can tend to their family. But in the case of women, woman uh, um, colleagues, this will have to be done. It cannot be so uh, insensitive as to make them work 24 by 7. It will not work. So if you want more women, you want to uh, make the police force more receptive uh, to uh, women victims, women uh, uh, issues, then you have to have a woman force, which is also you are able to give some flexible timing to them. The second thing which I feel that uh, will need to be done in other government uh, offices is that you will have to give them facilities. Uh, they may not be required like say the person is in the IAS or some other department, but you may not be able to give them a flexible timings, but from nine to five, if they have to work in the office, then the office should be able to provide some support for looking after the children. We have to develop crashes. We have to develop a system of where they can leave their child and work and close by, they can go and uh, if required, feed the child, whatever. So th those things are now, I think, the need of the hour. And that will be the next uh, jump which the government has to take. Must take. Yeah, yes. that's very interesting. You know, when it comes to policing, we know that the, it's, it's been looked out from outside, at least the, the epitome of masculinity. In a sense, the space is very masculine in terms of its architect. 
in terms of infrastructure, the thinking of people. Uh, that has been the traditional ways in which policing has been done. And um, how, uh, you know, when you come in as a woman police officer, you're also definitely a police officer, but you're also a woman. Um, uh, and this is a last, largely a masculine uh, space. So two questions on this. One is that I what I've seen and read your account is that you have retained your not only your femininity, uh, uh, and, but also celebrated the femininity, which is as a positive aspect of your personality. And you have, we've seen many accounts where moving accounts, in fact, of how it plays out for people that you have interacted with and how you touch their lives with your femininity. Yes. So that's one. Uh, uh, then how does it, you uh, know, how do we look at it from other police officers, especially women and men, uh, to retain that part of it? Because there are not many good examples. Uh, yes. uh, so that's our first question. I'll go to the next after this. Okay. So the question of me retaining my femininity, I think because of my upbringing, and even though I took charge of my life and started uh, working in the police force, that inherent uh, thing never left me. That inherent femininity and the sense of right and wrong did not leave me. And I have now, and over the years, I started believing that uh, it is important for women to retain their femininity because then the force also looks at you as a genuine person. And they trust you, that you are not somebody who's shamming to be like a male, uh, uh, like a male officer. They realize that, okay, you are genuinely a woman and you want to empathize or do something in that case, bringing the femininity part of it to that particular incident or situation. So if I have broken down in a case, if I am very emotional, and I break down uh, looking at a case, I have, I found that the men did not uh, get shocked. They thought that this was the natural thing that I was doing. And uh, I felt that uh, they became very supportive of me. So I, uh, uh, I put a lot of premium on trust. If, you, uh, if your force trusts you that you are a genuine person, uh, that helps in team building. Uh, then they don't look at you, oh, she has come, now she will be like a man and she will be pushing her agenda and all. They accept, yes, she is human and she's trying to do her best. So trust and, uh, uh, and confidence of the men around you also uh, uh, comes to you. They trust you that, okay, she is a genuine person and she, it's not that when she's crying, it is crying to... Uh, get sympathy but she's genuinely upset about that dead person or the dead body or the murder of a child or whatever has happened so uh, I think that uh, femininity can be a strength but I do not mean by femininity that you, you use your tears for a better posting use your tears to get perks for yourself tears uh, where it is required and you want to be a woman you be a woman don't try to be very uh, macho and very manly that this is the way I can do things. No, you can be a woman and you can still achieve. You should have a empathy. You should have a, a sense that uh, you are there to uh, suck, get, provide succor to people. You are there to help them. You are there to uh, build a better relationship. These should be our uh, strengths rather than to copy men and behave as if I'm a man. Very interesting. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of learning for all my women colleagues out there because this is an interesting point that you're making. Uh, one thing is you know, the global data tells us that um, the, uh, you know, one in every third woman actually has seen some other form of sexual harassment in their life. I'm sure you may have seen or come across something, uh, the connotations of sexual in nature or how do you protect one is yourself uh, being in a masculine force and environment which is very masculine because many women uh, definitely uh, also when they're going out they will also see uh, this kind of they'll experience some of these things and most of the time women don't come out in open because they feel that it is uh, it, it will may impinge on their career um, what advice would you have for women who may face uh, or likely to face sexual harassment how do they conduct themselves uh, what is the Point that they can make. So the first point I want to make it is that no woman should ever accept any wrong which is being done being done to them in the office or at home also. So at home the 
harassment can be of a different kind but let us talk about harassment at the workplace so if there is anybody harassing you you should come out and first of all confront the person and tell him that you are not going to accept it and if he doesn't stop and he continues then the best thing is to discuss the matter with your colleagues and file a complaint now the government has come out with uh, so many laws which are supportive of women and the women should be truthful enough to um, come out and uh, tell the men that they are not of that uh, uh, nature where they can treat them very casually so there is no harm in confronting the person and saying that they should be stopped and uh, at no point of time you should suppress those feelings and say that oh what will happen to me and what will be the consequences and things like that it may happen that in the male dominated society which we still are you are not given your due they it may turn around and they say that oh you were at fault and it was but don't give up take it to the next level appeal why should you get silent when you have been doing the right thing and you should not uh, uh, compromise on it at all at the same time don't misuse this law don't misuse this law to uh, further your own interest by saying that oh my boss has been tough on me or he's given me a bad acr i'll file a complaint against him or he's not giving me leave and i'm asking for this uh, benefit or that benefit and let me file a a sexual harassment case against him this is wrong this should also not happen uh, but do not allow any wrong done to you to be just left like that you please but do in your take uh, in your service long career did you face any issue where within the force women who are working uh, did they face any issue of this nature or how did they deal with it or did you support them was there anything which is within the women police force which we don't hear much about outside no no we did have problems we did have problems and people and being a very senior woman officer uh, i was often asked to head the complaints committee mm -hmm. and inquire into those uh, kind of cases and as i said that uh, i got a chance to find a woman who was uh, really being harassed and had to um say in black and white that the man was actually troubling her and the government took a very strong step at the same time i did a couple of cases in which it was the other way round where we felt that the woman was making false allegations and the man was only trying to do his duty and uh, just because she was a shirker and who did not want to do what was told to her she filed that complaint case so i have adjudicated and again my sense of right and wrong has been very strong in my career i have always felt that it is the right thing to do and i believe that if you do the right thing then only will you get the trust of people the public will also trust you the subordinates will trust you and your bosses will also trust you if you are not uh, going to do the right thing this uh, kind of ecosystem of trust will not build up so uh, i have had some very complicated sexual harassment cases to look into only because people felt that i would do justice in that case when they felt that uh, this is a case which is of a little gray area let uh, manjri have a look Take so it. that confidence they've had in me and i'm glad that uh, i could uh, sort of uh, uh be a part of that confidence and could do the right thing so slowly we are moving to the last segment of our conversation uh this is on more on how the bureaucrats conduct themselves because they are also public servants and they work uh, very closely with the politicians uh in your um, memoir you did discuss uh, your interaction with the politics of the day as well uh, but uh, for the career bureaucrats or people who are aspiring to be bureaucrats uh, how do they conduct themselves because you know being in a environment which probably a lot of time people think that it's, it's a corrupt system you get into the system you also become corrupt or you can't save yourself you know you have to compromise a lot uh, so that actually averses people to come into the organization because you know anybody who wants to work with a clean uh, habits will not like to enter into a, into bureaucracy uh, what will be your um, suggestions to people who are aspiring to get into the um, the services but wanted to be clean 
I think it is very much possible to be clean and still be in the services and uh, not get cowed down by what the politician wants you to do. I firmly believe that uh, we can remain uh, straightforward and still do our job very well. I've had uh, also a number of times uh, direct confrontation with politicians and I have been able to say that this is the way it should be done and it cannot be done in any other way. And then again, it's a question of trust because now they trust, they have trusted me. I have recorded in my book, there was, I was asked to do some very, very tricky uh, kind of recruitments or tricky kind of uh, enquiries, which uh, other people would have said, it is very difficult, I will not do it. But because uh, <clears throat> there was a kind of a trust because the politicians knew that I would be always saying the correct thing, they trusted me and my bosses also encouraged me and said that no, because they trust you and they are asking you to do something, you must do it because the public trust and the trust of anybody, you should not belie. So I feel that uh, when we say no to somebody, it is uh, the only thing that can happen to you is that you will be transferred. And is it so bad to be transferred? I have had transfers uh, overnight, not because I have uh, had a clash with a politician, but because the uh, the senior officer felt or the senior officers who was handling my uh, posting felt that I would do a better job. I was required at a particular place. So I was transferred overnight. It happened two or three times in my career. And it was always for a better um, uh, uh, job. But when the transfers came, I did feel bad that, you know, I'm now leaving my family. My son is taking the exams and I have to leave. But uh, I realized that they were uh, uh, meaning to uh, further my career rather than spoil my career. And the same thing I would say about the politicians. They need to be all, not all politicians are bad. They are also very helpful at times. And uh, uh, you have to build an image for yourself. You have to build an image that you are a no-nonsense type and you will do these things in this particular way. And I think uh, the number of women in the services are so small that every time the woman has to do the right time, the right thing. And every time she should succeed in doing the right work. Mm. So that is the only way to handle politicians. And People who say that, oh, I didn't do it because I was being pushed like that. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Yeah. So thank you so much. It has been an interesting memoir of uh, reading your memoir and as well as the conversation that we have, Manjiji. And uh, I want everyone to read this book, uh, Madam Sir. If you have not read it, I'm sure um, you have come across this, but interesting account of her life journey. And I look forward to reading the second book of yours, which I would say that you must uh, think of writing. There are many, many plots, I'm sure, coming. <laughs> Maybe after another 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank you so much.